Well, what you get to do is unique. And I, one of the things I appreciate the most about the content you put out is I think for a lot of people, it's their first exposure to hunting in general. And you do a good job of connecting hunting, which could be viewed as a selfish activity with conservation, which is, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, I don't want to say global because, you know, each country can do what they want, but it has an impact beyond what most people would think. For most people, let's be honest, and again, depending on where they live, I don't judge them, their interaction with sourcing their protein is going to a grocery store and they just, it's like, oh, this is where the ribeyes are. This is where the ribeyes always are. It's where they've always been. And it can be a little myopic. I think you can lose track of, of the impact of that and what it takes to have that meat right there for you every single day, you know, mm -hmm. at will versus going out hunting. And <laughs> maybe you're going to have a full freezer for the end of the year. Maybe you're not going to have a full freezer, depending on how it goes. But I'm curious your approach over the years. How do you connect the dots for people when it comes to hunting and conservationism? When I, early on in my career, I always imagined myself in the, in the stuff I did about hunting and fishing, that was the bulk of it. I always imagine myself as being explaining this thing, explaining this lifestyle um, mindset, discipline, uh, whatever word you use to capture a, a, a life of hunting and fishing. I always pictured that my work was explaining it to people who were outside looking in, meaning I was explaining it to people who were suspicious of it adversarial toward it just discovering it right and i was always sort of the thing kind of like uh welcome come on in and i'll show you around right this will be your first view into this world and that's how i imagined my work over time though i began to imagine it differently and i began to imagine that 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 that's happening i am talking to those people um, but that's not the conversation that I really care that much about. It, it just happens and I'll, and I allow it to happen. And that's great that it happens. But over time, maybe as I got older, I started to view more that I was, I was having a more important conversation with people that were like me, but who hadn't had the luxury of being able to really think about these things and the luxury of being able to get educated about these things. When I was uh, growing up, I lived at the Southern terminus of what was then called the Manistee National Forest, um, a couple miles from the National Forest, a mile maybe. Man, if you'd asked me where that National Forest came from, I would have told you it fell from outer space. It was just, there was <laughs> zero awareness of how something like that came to be. And not only zero awareness, zero care about how it came to be. If you'd have asked me the conservation history of white-tailed deer, which we hunted for intense and intensively, I would not have told you, I would not have been able to tell you that a hundred years prior, you wouldn't have found a deer. A hundred years prior, you would have went home and told someone if you saw a deer track in that area. Um, we hunted Canada geese. I would not have been able to tell you that Canada geese were nearly gone. Right. Um, I knew about Daniel Boone and liked Daniel Boone and thought he was cool. I would not have been able to tell you that Daniel Boone was a commercial deer hide hunter. Uh, um, and participated in the extirpation of elk and, and, and buffalo east of the Mississippi. I, would, I didn't know that. I just knew he was cool. And he is cool. So later, professionally, I was able to find all this stuff out. Right. And had I known that at the time, it would have been really helpful for me to sort of like frame my experience and be thankful for what I had and be more productive and more constructive. So now when I do the work I do, I more imagine just talking to people, talking to myself, my, a different version of myself and, 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 and saying not from like a not being didactic or not being preachy, but just saying, hey, there's there's these things that we love. You might not recognize that you love them. That might not be a word you use. But I have a feeling that you do love this stuff. Like you love the natural world. Um, and here's some things that that you should know about it. Because when I found out about them, it really changed my life a lot. It made my life more enjoyable and made everything I do more meaningful. So that's like, that's who I picture talking to now. 
I don't know that that conversation becomes any less entertaining or relevant to outsiders looking in, but that's what I'm doing now. Like if I had to pick, if I had to talk to hunters and anglers or non hunters and anglers, I wouldn't even think about it, dude. I wouldn't even think about it. It'd be, I'll talk, I'll talk to hunters and anglers. Really? About what we have going on. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I would agree with you. I have, I didn't, uh, I didn't start hunting until I came up to Montana yeah, the the lack of thought that I put into understanding the ecosystem that is available for me, like I said, to access, come out of the front door and like, which direction do I want to go today? There's going to be mm-hmm. something awesome out here. Yeah, the national forest, the the biology that may be involved, uh, the species control, you know, even just an understanding of reservation area we're up where I live. There's reservation area all over the place, but there also is, you know, Glacier National Park and where all of these things come from. Yeah, I bet you most hunters, they're probably more in my category than yours or where you were before you started taking a a hard look at it. Yeah, it's not even, I don't don't even mean that. I don't mean that as a negative. Uh, You know, a lot of times people say like they need to get educated. What that generally means is it's like they need to be subjected to my propaganda. Um, You know what I mean? Like they need, they need to be educated, meaning I wish they agreed with me. And I, yeah. I don't mean that people need to be educated. I don't mean in a condescending way. I just like to say that, like, I had the luxury to spend a lot of time on this stuff because because of the professional path I took. I had the luxury to to, to learn a lot of things and 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 like to share those things. Um, but, man, the last thing I have, you know. I remind I, I remind myself all the time about how I was when I was younger. Right. Um, how I related to wildlife laws, how I related to landscape management, just everything, you know. And I'm like, unless I'm willing to say I hate my I hate myself back then and I don't, I don't look back and hate who I was, then I can't hate on people who <laughs> I can't yeah. hate on people who were a facsimile of how I was. <laughs> well, now that I've given it at least two minutes to think about this, since I haven't thought about it much. I think you're correct in talking with the hunters and anglers because the more they know, the better advocate they can be for what they're doing. And they'll have the opportunity to have those day-to-day conversations with people who may never be exposed to it. You might be banging your head against a closed door more so than with the hunter and angler crowd. At least they'd be receptive. And actually, if they're smart enough, the more that they educated themselves, the better hunter and angler they would become anyway. And then, mm-hmm. of course, the better spokesman for what it is that they're passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things I appreciate about your uh, content, you know, I go on YouTube and let's just say that my feed is an absolute nightmare um, because it's, of course, what you're searching for. So I have like mountain bike crashes, airplanes crashing, and then it's (laughs) and around hunting season, it's 30 kill shots in two minutes, you know, or 50. You're you're a pilot now. Why do you look up? uh, Why do you look up airplane crashes? (laughs) I need to understand. I need to understand what they did wrong so I cannot do this. (laughs) No, that's good. Yeah, I, I suppose yeah. that makes sense, right? Why did that airplane wing fall off? Okay, don't do what they did. Don't try to fly through a thunderstorm cloud, and you're probably going to be all right. No. But it the social media platforms, it's all, hey, here's the 30 seconds before shooting an animal, and then it ends right after the shot, and it runs off. I love the emphasis you put on the after. And in my limited time hunting, <laughs> I'm by no means an expert, The the work begins after you get the animal on the ground. Like a lot of these animals, like one of the hardest things I've found is actually finding them. Oh, once, yeah, you lo- <laughs> once you locate them, it's, you know, they're, they're not out there doing calculus and algebra. It's not that incredibly hard to kill them, especially with the very high powered long range rifle. The work starts when you actually can get up to that animal. Like, Oh boy, how do we get this thing out of here? How do we preserve the meat? How do we get every ounce of meat off of this skeleton? What are we going to do with this? Who's going to, it's, And then, I mean, there's that aspect, but I love the emphasis you put on the cooking afterwards and the camaraderie Mm -hmm. and telling the story over the, over the meal. I literally just last night, my wife made elk spaghetti uh, with uh, elk meatballs of the bull that I had killed in Wyoming. They turned that thing at the butcher in 36 hours and we were home with it. And my dad was there and his wife and they just moved to Montana. He's talking about how much he wants to go hunting next year. I'm like, well, get your driver's license because that's when the timer starts. You need to have that sucker six months. And my son is there and he's talking about wanting to start hunting, but it's all based around the meal. We're not talking about a hunting story. We're just talking about where this meal came from. And I think that emphasis, it's not that you are 
you're not the only person that talks about it, but I appreciate the fact that you highlight everything that happens after the arrow release or the trigger being pulled. Because to me, that's, that's where the lion's share of it occurs anyway. You know, when I started doing a lot of stuff around wild game, I got, my first book was called The Scavenger's Guide to Oak Cuisine, and I published it in 2005. And it was just all about just making crazy stuff out of wild game. Um, and it had to do with like this French chef and this whole kind of elaborate story. But at its core, it was a wild game. It was a book about cooking with wild game. And man, it just wasn't discussed that much back then at all. At all. Um, it was shocking to people at the time. Uh, it just wasn't had it just hadn't been it felt like such low-hanging fruit just to explain this thing that i had always been raised around and i was raised when i was brought up it was like what eating wild game was like really in our family it was celebratory and was often celebratory because you would literally that would be the foundation of having people over do you know what i mean so I remember my dad like when the salmon were running they they would have this party the big salmon boil tons of fish fries right everybody comes over and you fry fish um it was just always like community you know people getting together having a good time and i always had like that feeling you want when i went to when i started college I, first two years of college i did i went away to um or i stayed and, and went to community college and i was trapping and just lived at my parents house and then i finally moved away after two years of community college and I moved in with my brother and, and a buddy of ours. And I remember we ate we ate four deer in the house we lived in in college, full time students. I remember we ate four deer between October one and Christmas break. It was because, <laughs> dude, people would come over our house. Yeah, and like we were dirt bags, man. But we always had salmon. We always had uh, tons of fish. We always had tons of deer meat, and people would just come over our house, and we'd just party. And like, you know, drink our faces off and fry deer meat. And it was just like, people loved it, dude. We'd serve deer meat to people who'd never had any exposure to it. And um, it just kind of became our thing, you know, that, that people got, it was hard to explain, but people got excited by it. But it was a playbook that I had gotten from my dad. And like a playbook I had gotten from my dad's friends who would go out and catch stuff and shoot stuff. And then they'd all gather around and make stuff to eat. And it was just, it was just like a, how it was how people had a good time. And so I got into that and then we just got into doing weirder and weirder things, you know, and I would read, I would read history and I would history books and I would see how Native Americans prepared some dish, you know, they probably didn't use the word dish. Well, they didn't use any of the words I'm using, but they would prepare a prep, they would make some preparation. And it was because the internet wasn't around, you couldn't find out what it was. You'd see a reference to things. Like if you ran into the word pemmican, right? You'd run into the word pemmican in a book. Picture pre-internet. Unless you were like a card catalog sleuth at a good library, you were not going to find out what pemmican meant. Yeah, good luck with that. Do you know what I mean? Like it's hard to remember now. <laughs> well, also remember that if you went out at night and, and you told your friends you were going to be somewhere and meet them, if something changed, you weren't going to meet up with them because it wasn't even phones <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have cell phones, you know, so yeah, you couldn't find out about stuff like that. Like what was pemmican? How did mountain men cook beaver tails? Um, all this junk. And so it, it was, it was like all this road, open road of just experimentation and finding stuff out. This is one of the, you know, when people write a history, you know, and they, I'm sure they will like some great documentary about how much stuff changed with the internet. I would like to go on that documentary and explain how much wild game cooking <laughs> changed with the internet. But like I said, it was like such low hanging fruit at the time. They sort of like talk about all this stuff, you know, it was a riot, man. It was fun. It was fun doing it. It was fun figuring out so much stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box, and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. 
I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speedgo. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. God, I remember printing out directions. I think it was MapQuest or something and taking like six pages of poorly printed out shit to try to find the restaurant to meet my buddy. Like... And then you just like God, and then yeah, God forbid they change plans. Like I don't know where that place is, and that you'd whip out the book that had all the streets and try to do your X Y graph. <laughs> I mean, the, there's that low tech. I think in the high tech world, though, in the the power of the mediums, whether it be, you know, your TV show or the podcast or all that stuff, I find that cooking is an interesting way to open the door for people conceptually when it comes to conservation because everybody's going to eat and some people choose not to eat meat and you know mm. live your life live your life however you want to but in the era where there's a lot of people worried about a lot of things you know whether it be overpopulation water climate change whatever it might be i don't re i don't think people realize how much you can detach yourself from a lot of those things that they are worried about and have a very a much more positive control hand in it when it comes to, uh, you know, if you look at the water supply in the United States, 80 to 90 percent of it is allocated towards agriculture. And a lot of that is agriculture towards feeding beef cows, which, mm -hmm. pe again, people will go to the store and like, this is the ribeye section. They're always right here. Or the fact that there, you know, there's basically one wild mammal per 15 beef cows sitting on a factory farming, um, which most people use that term negatively, but it also is a, a kind of a requirement to feed our population. By sitting down, and I have exposed so many people to wild game since I have started hunting and talking to them about the whole process of the, the hunt is afterwards, but like, this is what this animal is. This is where that animal lived. And oh, by the way, if you are concerned about the impact of factory farming or the impact that it has on the water tables, you have a choice. So you can almost nudge them towards uh, a different education when it comes to that conservationism through the lens of hunting, but that's through the plate that's in front of them. And it's one of my favorite things about it. You know, uh, I I'll take that on and comment on that, but I, I always think it's important to point out if even in the absence, like even in the absence of anything off putting about factory farming, like if, if factory, if, if, if uh, agricultural facilities, the animals, they were people read poetry to them and pet them all day. Right. I'd still hunt. You know what I mean? Like Same. I'm still going to go get my own stuff. <laughs> um, so it's not, it's like, it's not a response to that. That's a thing that's in the background and I'm aware of it, but I would do it regardless. You know, um, I would still want to go get my own food. Uh, but it's funny earlier I was talking about the two different audiences outside inside audience yep. um if you come in my house like there's all kinds of furs and skulls and stuff everywhere people that don't hunt man people that when I have people that don't hunt come over my house for dinner no one ever ever will look at like my wall of skulls and be like dude I want to go hunting it just <laughs> like <laughs> they don't care like yeah. guys hunt will look and be like oh that's pretty cool where did this come from or whatever people that don't hunt when they eat dinner they get interested yep or maybe you know they get interested um it opens their mind to a discussion it winds up changing their mind and it's more like they would be more likely in the future when someone when they're having a conversation or they're looking at some ballot initiative that's meant to like uh take away hunters rights or they're talking to an anti-hunter they'd be more likely to say you know what man thing is i used to feel the way you do but i know a bunch of hunters and when they're at home at night that's all they eat they feed that their families that's just what they do um 
So I don't care. They're going out getting their own food. I would picture that conversation, and I know that conversation happens more than them saying, oh, I know hunters, and they always hang that shit around their house. <laughs> right? it's just, For sure. It's just, it's more impactful to them. I do both, and, and we have it hanging all over our house, and it's in our freezer, and that's what we eat at night by, 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 almost by like law. That's what we eat in my household. Um, and it's, and it, it, it is impactful to people to, to, to have those meals and see that because we're like, we're a pragmatic species, you know, I mean, many of us aren't, but there's, people are still governed by a level of pragmatism. And if you can look and see that, if you can look around you and see that you have healthy wildlife populations, there's enough deer running around that they're in your yard, they're getting hit by cars. Um, and you see that like, well, whatever these hunters got going on, they haven't decimated the deer herds. There's, I see deer around, I see turkeys around and they eat it. Um, and that's what they eat at night. Uh, I find that people are like, yeah, I used to think that they were a bunch of crazy ass rednecks, but I see it now. Like it makes sense to me, you know, and it just, it changes their view of the activity. I've just seen that. I've seen that play out hundreds of times, man. Yeah, I have too. I think it's a more powerful approach than just the metaphorical shotgun blast. Like you need to start hunting now because I do like that just turns people off. Sure. And I, I point out, I don't have many conversations when I don't point this out. If every American went out and killed a deer, I think we'd have a 200 million deer deficit. So uh, that ain't plausible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. It'll always be a thing that's just limited. It'll always be a thing that's a limited number of people participate in. Yeah. Well, as somebody who has spent so much of their time outdoors, what would you say collectively we could do as a country better when it comes to preserving the wild places that both you and I enjoy so much? Habitat protection. What mechanism would you uh, approach that through? Um, having the... Well, what mechanism would I approach? I mean, there, there's so many levers to pull. Um, it, it, like at the highest level, it comes down to this, I think. Well, I'll say a couple things on this issue. Theodore, okay, Theodore Roosevelt, a widely celebrated conservation leader, um, president in the early 1900s, he set aside about 50,000 acres for every day in office into it didn't take they didn't have the names that it has now they were they had forest preserves and other things he was rampant about setting aside habitat protecting habitat and as much as he's celebrated now and they carved his face into mount rushmore and every every politician wants to liken themselves to um theodore roosevelt no one ever takes a shot at the guy right on the campaign trail he was maligned at the time. Um, they hated him. Hmm. And today they would call him a bunny hugger, tree hugger, environmental wacko was what they would call him today. Um, he, he would have a crosshair on him for what he did for wildlife habitat because he went against industrial interests, right? Like I said, he would be, a, he would be like a tree hug and live. Um, so you need to play the long game when, when we look at landscape level habitat decisions, uh, when Roosevelt was setting all that land aside, wildlife in America was in a very, very bad spot. There just wasn't much of it. Things had been shot out by unregulated hunting. They'd been poisoned off, um, killed off through habitat destruction, habitat loss. His play was, his play was, if you take care of the land, the animals will take care of themselves. And the step one was to begin to create a place for wildlife to recover. I still think that, that that's what conservation comes down to. And the metaphor I often use would be like, let's say we're talking about an apple tree. An apple tree will produce apples and it will continue to produce apples. Now, some people might look 
if you imagine an animal rights perspective on an apple tree is an animal rights perspective would be that you're going to look at the apple tree and you're going to have a lot of concern for all those individual apples. And you're going to be, I don't want anything bad to happen to any of those apples. Um, and they don't even see the tree. They see the individual apples and they want to protect those individual apples. But the individual apples fall to the ground and rot. And what stays put is the tree and the next year that tree produces and the next year that tree produces and the next year that tree produces. Um, a hunter conservationist is very interested in the tree. Take care of the tree and the apples will take care of themselves, right? Yeah. So that's why I, I'm, I feel that identifying wildlife habitat, productive wildlife habitat, and slowing the development, slowing the destruction of wildlife habitat is of utmost importance. And I think that it also involves um, recognizing landscapes that are great producers of wildlife that other people like to trash on. I am a cows, not condos kind of conservationist, right? Um, productive landscapes include farms, productive landscapes include ranches, productive landscapes include a host of places that just aren't laid over in concrete. Um, yeah. And that is how we need to, that is how we need to win in, in the U.S. You know, other places are out of our control. Well, not totally. People would argue that, but that's where I focus my efforts. It's in the United States of America. There's a lot of things I like about the Mountain Tough program, but I think primarily what I enjoy is they focus on mental toughness in addition to just the physical toughness. Everything they do is grounded in one purpose, life transformations and being strong between the years in the mind. And there's also a community of 15,000 plus Mountain Tough athletes. So the community is strong, they're supportive, and they're going to help keep you accountable. So you can train anywhere. You can stream anywhere. You can access guided training and on-demand workouts right from your phone, your tablet, or TV or computer, whatever you're into. And everything you need is in one spot. The Mountain Tough subscription gets you access to all of the Mountain Tough programs, new programs, and bonus content. And they have programs for everyone. Those who hit the gym and heavy weights, those who like to work out at home with no gear or minimal gear, and everything in between. Mountain Tough has been the trusted training by the dedicated for years now including U.S. military, special forces, and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you to not start the day. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with the ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, they will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything that life throws away. Mountain Tough subscribers get full access to world-class home and gym programs, groundbreaking mental toughness training, self-improvement, prehab and rehab, biomechanical form coaching, stretching and mobility flows, nutrition guidance, challenge workouts, and the global Mountain Tough community. Mountain Tough is offering Change Agents listeners an incredible offer. You're going to get 40% off on the all-new Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription with the code CHANGEAGENTS. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to receive 40% off, a savings of about $100 on your Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription. That is mtn, Mike Tango November, tough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to save 40%. That is less than 50 cents per day for the best in-class physical and mental training. Hey there, everybody. Before we get back to the interview, if you want to grab a hat or a shirt like the one I'm wearing right now, go visit shop.thisisironclad.com and use the code CHANGEAGENTS. That's going to be all one word, all caps, for 15% off of your order. Ironclad just restocked their inventory, so get them before they're gone. And make sure to follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad. Stay in the know for exclusive collaborations that are going to be coming soon. That's shop.thisisironclad.com, code CHANGEAGENTS. One word, all caps. It's going to get you 15% off of your order. All right, let's get back to the show.
When you look at the U.S., are there any particular areas that you think are more urgent than others? Yeah, there's a really there's a surgical approach. There, there's like there's two approaches. There's sort sort of the um, I'll start with the third surgical approach. We've got so much data coming out now from tracking collars on animals. This is just an example where we have so much G, uh, GIS data, like, you know, ba putting collars on animals and watching them where they go. And we've been able to really identify, I mean, I, I'm talking about everything from, from grizzly bears to mule deer to ducks, right? Yep. It's really given us this very detailed picture of what wildlife needs as it moves across the landscape, right? Meaning we might think of a wildlife corridor as 20 miles wide, but you might look and be like, you know what? 20 miles wide, there's a lot of mule deer that go through that spot. But you know where they really go through? Is this 100 yards is where 70% of them go through, right? And it allows us to be really, really surgical. And I'm talking about identifying like, like wildlife passage corridors. And we can go like, man, if we got a migratory herd and we can do, do fence work and make sure we eliminate obstacles and eliminate developments on this very narrow path, that's a great way to spend our money. And we can be really precise about it. Or with waterfowl, they love this estuary. And if they don't have that estuary, they're kind of boned, right? And we can be like, let's make sure we buckle down on that. That stuff's super important. And there's, there's groups that do that work. Likewise, I think there are huge areas that we still have the luxury of looking out for. Um, I, along with so many other people that hunt and fish, was very involved in this conversation around pebble mine in Alaska and preventing the headwaters of Bristol Bay, which is the largest salmon run globally, preventing those th that headwaters ecosystem from getting developed for a gold mine. Um, people could label it anti-jobs, but it was just the wrong thing to do in the wrong place. Um, I don't think that we should mess with the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I don't think we should open it up for development. These are large scale projects. Um, so it, it happens on that granular level and it happens on that grand level. Um, and there are groups and individuals who are focused in those spaces. And I, and I take a somewhat more holistic view is that I'm very interested in all of those conversations. Um, but you can kind of take your pick. Right. You could become a person who's intensely focused on a particular mountain pass, or you could become a person who's intensely focused on the Arctic coast, right? Depending on your your worldview and where your interests lie. I think you need both. I think you need those surgical players and then the strategic ones as well. People sure. passionate yeah. passionately fighting about whatever they uh Muley hunters, you know, up in Montana, passionate about that. And then people who are looking at holistically the whole state or like you're saying up in the Alaskan Peninsula. So let's say hypothetical, maybe this will happen in the future. For 24 hours, you are in charge of U.S. wildlife and hunting policy. You can make whatever change you want. <laughs> and they are not allowed to, let's say, nobody can change it uh, for a decade. What would you change about U.S. policy? Um, hunting policy or like landscape management? Both. Oh. You're king for 24 hours. You throw yeah, whatever levers you it. want to. This is, okay. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would do some small little personal things. I would make it that hunter's orange laws were an orange hat no matter where you went. Um, I would take Yellowstone National Park and put it into a wilderness area. I'd probably take, uh, it, uh, I would turn it into a wilderness area and do it under state management for wildlife and make it much more protected as a wilderness area and take out the infrastructure. And these are just personal pet peeve things. And then I would find some way, I would get a bunch of landscape people together and find some way in which we could identify what would be regarded as, as a substantial tract of undeveloped land and find a way to make it that it could not be developed. Um, and I would lock in traditional use practices, such as hound hunting, um, predator hunting, 
fur trapping. I would lock in and codify legal protections for traditional use practices as long as those traditional use practices were not leading to uh, loss of an, of loss of native wildlife and make them and make them uh, invulnerable to changes in public opinion. I like and it. then I'd take stock and see how much time I had left after I got those things taken care of. Probably like 23 hours. I mean, you're just up there throwing <laughs> levers. <laughs> so this is fast. This happens fast. I mean, you're, you're writing policy. You got a quill pen up there and you're just writing stuff that can't be touched for a decade. Well, yeah, I would go, I, I would go from there. That'd be the, that'd be my, that'd be the first handful of things I'd take on. Yeah. I know we're uh, running close to the, a lot of time we had for you. Two more questions for you. Where would you start people for people who can't hunt? And, and there mm -hmm. are a lot of people, whether it's yeah. an economic situation, a geographic situation, but they want to educate themselves more on just the understanding of hunting or conservation, or perhaps even just where they go to the grocery store and, hey, here's our ribeye section. Yep. Where would you start people as an easy and accessible entry point for their own education? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I would have them read, uh, I'd have them go watch Ken Burns' new documentary, The American Buffalo. Um. I was in that. I was one of the talking heads in that. But we only have like you know a handful of cool the American Buffalo. Is that on Netflix? No, it's uh, it's a his new PBS documentary. All right, I'm writing that down. It's like a four hour history of of um that animal. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in that animal. I wrote a whole book about it called. I wrote a book about it a decade ago called American Buffalo in Search of a Lost Icon. Um. But this this is a new film out that helps explain a lot of things about wildlife. Uh, I would check that out. I would check out. Um, I would read some Roosevelt biographies. I would very much read Eldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac. Um. The book Arctic Dreams was really influential to me in understanding. And Barry Lopez, the author of Arctic Dreams, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was very uneasy with hunting. <laughs> and um, in, in the in, in the Ken Burns documentary does not paint a flattering portrait of Euro-American hunters at all. And Barry Lopez was uneasy with hunting, but wrote a phenomenal book about wildlife and humans called Arctic Dreams. Uh and as I'm running through this list, I realize that I might, you might read all this and become a big anti-hunter, or you might read all this and feel like you had an epiphany about wildlife in America. But but those are the things that really shaped my view, that, that shaped my view on it. I have a project coming out that I did with my colleague, Clay Newcomb, and it's called uh, Meat, Eaters, Meat Eaters American History. And the first installment is about the long hunters. So it's about the early Euro-American hunters around Daniel Boone's era what they accomplished and the crimes they committed. Um, that I think would help shape who get an understanding of who we are, how we came to be the way we are, why you see the things that you do when you look out the window, how that, why, why that wildlife is there, who's paid for and protected that wildlife. That's a lot, but those are some things that I would begin to ask people to take in or suggest that people take in. Um, no, that's that's what awesome. To do first, say I would say Sand County Almanac first. Okay. Yeah, I'm writing all this stuff down. All right, final and probably most difficult question for you before I let you go. How challenging was it to take? Brian Callen hunting, given that the man cannot take anything serious. <laughs> man, yeah. He's a he great is... friend. My God, he never turns it off. So I can't no. even fathom trying to be quiet in the <laughs> He really it's it's stunning. He doesn't turn it off. And he's just one of the uh man, you laugh so hard being with that guy. 
Like I would laugh so hard being with that guy that after a couple of days. Like people always say that you like, you know, it hurts. Like I would legitimately yeah. have I would legitimately have abdominal pain, like abdominal muscle pains from laughing so hard with Brian Callen. Um, my God, he's funny. Yeah, I guess you just have to somehow hope that deep down, like below the comedy and below the need to just entertain people around him, that there's some <laughs> there's <laughs> some cerebral thing <laughs> happening he, and i think it is down there but my god that guy is funny man yeah. i mean i have never like it, i've known a lot of funny people right i've never had someone make me laugh like that guy makes me laugh um ever you know? yeah it's completely counterproductive to what you were trying to do with him that's why i had to ask <laughs> it's i can't even you know i've known him for a good amount of time and you can't even go to dinner without him you're basically at a comedy show. I'm like, hey, man, I'm trying to eat, and food's getting ready to come out of my nose. I need you yeah. to stop. So I can't even imagine trying to – I think you took him, what, blacktail hunting with Joe? We took him mule deer hunting, <laughs> took him turkey hunting, took him blacktail hunting. Oh, my God, yeah. No, I, I'd go – he's just yeah, just an incredibly funny person and just really gifted. But, man, uh, it, <laughs> it wears you out in the best possible way. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I will leave the uh, final words to you, Mr. Rennell. What would you like to, what would you like to leave people with? Oh, well, um, man, if you got kids, well, I just want to, let me, I want to plug something if you don't mind. Um, Please do. My last two. So my last two books, I have a outdoor cookbook coming out soon, but my last two books, I've, I've just, I've been a parent for a long time now, 13 years my last two books were about kids. So my previous title was outdoor kids in an inside world. And it's about the challenges and rewards of raising your kids to have a close relationship with nature. And then I followed that up um, with a book called catch a crayfish count the stars, which is a book for kids. Outdoor kids in an inside world is a book for parents or caregivers. Catch a crayfish count the stars is a book for kids. So it's things for kids to do, read activities that will really enhance their understanding of wildlife, navigation, hunting skills, cooking skills, gardening skills, and um, educate and inspire them around living an outdoor lifestyle. So uh, I, I like those books a lot because I think they're, they're, they're helpful. And I've had just such great experiences raising my kids outdoors, and I'm real proud of them. And, and I think that that hopefully those books will, if people are raising their kids, I like to think that those books would be helpful for other parents. It's actually the long game too. You know, it's the generational approach that pays off in the long term, which is the exact opposite of this immediate have to have satisfaction instantaneously in the world that we live in. Kids are a long game, man. You yep. won't, um, you won't really know fully how you did till you're on your deathbed. And that'll be your last glimpse. <laughs> that'll be your last glimpse, right? Yeah. I just hope I've gone to their house shortly before that and stolen all their phone chargers and socks <laughs> like they do for me. <laughs> and then left all their tools out in the rain. <laughs> totally. Just try. That's, I think that's my long-term play with my kids is wait until they get married and just do all the things that they did to me. Yeah. So. Yeah, dump, dump, dump their toolbox in the rain, take their scissors, stapler, and tape dispenser. <laughs> yep. Only when they critically need it, of course, and they can't find it. So, <laughs> Right on, man. Well, I really appreciate the time, and honestly, I really appreciate everything you do for the outdoor space and everything you've done for hunting and conservation. It's uh, You were one of my first uh, introductions to it, actually through Joe's podcast. It was one of the first episodes that oh, I ever really? listened to. Good deal. I, you know, in hindsight, I should have listened to a podcast before I went on his. It was just not a good approach. But then I encountered one of yours with him shortly thereafter and to kind of launch the uh, interest and uh, journey, not only into podcasting, but like I said, it's for my wife and I, it's it's the resource to go back to when we're looking for either hunting entertainment or mostly education, though. Well, thank you, man. You're, you're a very generous host. I appreciate that and look forward to uh, like to hang out with you someday in the future. So we should stay in touch. Sure. Indeed, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time, Steve. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. I highly recommend you Google Steve and 
the works that he has written. Uh, I have a few of the cookbooks at my house, actually, and since recording this episode, I have already gone on to Amazon and kind of filled out my collection of everything else that he has written. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an Ironclad original, and we'll be back next week with an all-new episode. 